Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I am your host, Nick Barksdale, and today we are joined by a very special guest. She is actually one of the earliest academic historians that I actually started reading uh, when I got away from basic history and I wanted to go to something a little bit deeper. And honestly, I found her work to be absolutely thrilling from her awesome work on Thucydides to a very interesting read that really goes along with our latest series with Dr. Rebecca Fudo Kennedy on race and ethnicity in the ancient Mediterranean. But this book you can see actually behind me is titled Not Out of Africa. And it really goes through quite a few things from the Black Athena debate to the controversy surrounding the Black Athena hypothesis and her issues that she takes with it and why. And honestly, it, it's actually what led me to read Black Athena in the first place. And I, it, was, it was awesome. I loved it all. And it was very interesting. And it's honestly, it's a pleasure to have you on this YouTube channel today. Dr. Lefkowitz, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you very much, Nick. It's, it's, uh, it's a privilege. It's a privilege. And it's interesting after all this time to talk about these issues again. They're, the question of fictional history never fails to be relevant. So. And to my subscribers, definitely check out the links in the video description below. I'm not only going to provide links to her books, such as Not Out of Africa, but I'm also going to provide you links to her academic works that she's published online from articles, so on and so forth. So you can take advantage of all the awesome things that she has to offer to help me and you better understand the history that we all love. Firstly, due to the context of this episode, or episodes, depending on if I decide to break them up or not, I would like you to define something for us today. Would you define Afrocentrism and Eurocentrism and really walk us through how you view them in your own way? Is one a response to the other? Would you really clarify that for us? Because I know that different professionals like yourself tend to sometimes have different outlooks. Different outlooks is putting it very politely. Well, in a way, you have to go back to the history of this country, which is so fraught with terrible problems. Um, the bringing over to this continent enslaved people from Africa to work in plantations. Um, that's, if we didn't have that history, we'd be a lot happier today. And many, many fewer people would have suffered. But, you know, it's a country that's been taken over by immigrants and European immigrants. Some came over voluntarily, some much less voluntarily, like uh, all of my ancestors. But they weren't enslaved. They, they were able to settle here and do, do whatever they were capable of doing, which in some cases were peddling things, in other cases just owning stores. It, it, it varied. So I think that is where we begin with Afrocentrism and Eurocentrism. The people who came from Europe um, brought within their culture and their languages, and the people from Africa had all that taken away from them when they were brought over in slave ships. Uh, their identities erased everything. So no compensation would be sufficient for that. Uh, and a lot of it still goes on the, for the people who are the descendants of, of those people. It's possible to get out of that, but it, money has always helped in this country. This is a plutocracy. So the more money you have, the further you can get. So Afrocentrism is a response to the domination of European ideas. And I think that I, I was one of the people who helped to start um, Black Studies, which later became Africana Studies at Wellesley College, where I taught my entire career. And I think that that has certainly helped for people to study uh, everything connected um, with the African diaspora. But I, I also um, think that European studies needs to account for that much more than it did when, say, I was an undergraduate back in the 50s. Uh, it just wasn't discussed, except in American history, where it most certainly was discussed. And I, I had an American history at school, as everyone else had to have. And I was extremely fortunate to have an American his, a historian teaching that, who 
made us read slave narratives, made us look at the other side of things from what the textbook was telling us. So that was my, at school, was my introduction to how things can be distorted by historians. So where I encountered Afrocentrism after that was just simply from discovering that uh, a member of our Africana Studies Department was teaching that Greek philosophy was stolen from Africa, and I'd never heard of that idea. So that's why that's how I got into looking into that and how this particular myth got started in antiquity and how it was then taken up um, later. So, so Afrocentrism is, there are two phases of it. One is to get people more interested in the history of the African diaspora, which I think is really important. And the other is this mythic uh, set of ideas that really aren't historical. And they have some, you know, connections to history, but it's, it's distorted. And I don't think, I certainly don't want to stop anybody from learning anything they want or reading anything they want, but they ought to see it in context of what it is, which was uh, a reaction to the terrible experience that many of them must have had. Uh, have you been to the Museum of African American History in, in uh, Washington? No, but I would love to. It's worth doing. It, it, and just seeing what life was like in the South, uh, not only in the uh, 18th century, but the 19th and 20th century, uh, was enough to just drive you to tears. It's just, you know, we kind of were oblivious to it in the North, but it was going on. Well, anyway, that's a, a brief intro. My next question is, and I feel like this is very fundamental for people wanting to read your work to better understand uh, these historical issues that are going on, especially in historiography, and that is, what led you personally to write Not Out of Africa? Well, what led me to write it was I had not been thinking about anything uh, about these issues at all. I'd read Black Athena because uh, someone had sent my husband, who was a classics professor, Sir Hugh Lloyd-Jones, and they sent, sent him a copy of Black Athena, and he said, I don't have time to read this, you read it. So I read it, and I said, well, this is kind of crazy. I, don't, I, I, I can see that there is some point in what he's saying about the limitations of ancient history and what things they've chosen to study and not to study. But I looked at the etymologies, and I, I did linguistics at Harvard, so I thought, <laughs> this stuff is nuts. So I I'm, didn't have much time. I was doing something else, and I put it aside. Um, but later, I, I can't remember exactly how I discovered it. Uh, people said to me, I, I think a student, a very interesting student I had, a, a um, continuing edu- education student, an adult, um, came and said, you know, Tony Martin is teaching some very strange things in his uh, history of ancient Africa class. And she told me about this. And I didn't really want to believe it because I believe so strongly in the idea of having a, an Africana studies department. But <laughs> um, a student then I had was really not very happy in class. And it turned out that it was a class on uh, Plato's Apology in Greek. I had never mentioned that Socrates was black. Well, the reason I had never mentioned that is I didn't know that. I, I knew that Socrates tells us that he was, he was born in Athens, and then, in fact, he'd never left Athens uh, except to go on military service um, in, the, in the fort in, in Attica. And, and uh, Athenian citizens had to be the descendants of Athenian citizens. You know, it just was not anything that had crossed my path. But the reason I got into writing all this was that I was writing occasionally for, for journals like Times Literary Supplement, and uh, somehow the New Republic heard of me, and Leon Wieseltier asked me to, who was the literary editor, asked me to write a review of some books uh, about Afrocentric ancient history, and he sent me Bernal Vol 1, and and I think it had maybe two as well, because it was out at the time. And uh, this book, Stolen Legacy by George G.M. James, 
And that was the one that really, I read, of course, Fall One of Bernal, but I read it again. And when I saw the connection between the two, which no one had made except Leon, uh, and Leon may have made it, or he may just have picked up a bunch of Afrocentric books and shoved them in a box and sent them to Wellesley. So I, I started reading all this stuff. And I, I mean, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that this was the real thing that Bernal had gotten hold of. And that stolen legacy was one of, it was just wrong in so many ways but you could see what inspired it. So it was really painful. So I wrote the, the review, which was published uh, in, in the New Republic. And they had this rather inflammatory cover on it, which is what you have right there uh, pictured, which uh, Basic Books picked up, having told me they would put another much less inflammatory cover on it. And then without telling me, they put that cover on it. I was a little annoyed, to put it mildly. But... Uh, that's how it got going. And uh, I got into the whole thing because I tried to show in the review that, that Bernal, this whole connection was there and that both Bernal and Stolen Legacy, the claims they made, couldn't really be right. And uh, that created an awful lot of correspondence. I think I spent the rest of the academic year replying to people when I wasn't teaching. <laughs> and, and then... Um, my agent suggested, you know, you really ought to write a book about this. So I got off to writing a book about it. So, uh, but, but meanwhile, an, uh, another publisher, North Carolina Press, got uh, Lou Bateman, uh, who was the classics editor at the time, got after me and said, well, maybe you should also do this, uh, a, a book about Black Athena. But I said, well, I can't do it alone because there's so many things I don't know. Well, they said, then, Get, collect essays, get people to write different, different things. And I, got, I asked uh, my, my colleague, Guy Rogers, who, who is an ancient historian, to go in on the project with me, because at the time I wasn't entirely well, among other things. And also Guy knew a, a tremendous amount of stuff that I didn't know. So that's, that's how I got into this whole business which is not where I had planned to be. I was working on other projects and, and, you know, other things that classicists usually do, which is try and understand what a text means. And, but this was very interesting and took me out of of the classics world into a much wider uh, public. And I'm very grateful that I did that and had the chance to do it. That is really interesting. Yeah, I can only imagine the uh, the correspondence you got. Uh, would you say they were primarily positive or negative? Both. I think one of the things that cheered me up most was I got a quite long letter from Henry Louis Gates Jr. Who, at Harvard, and and Skip uh, Skip Gates told me that uh, he was very glad I wrote the book, and he had he had written. Uh, and I can't remember the chronology of this exactly, but he either around then he wrote a very uh, important op-ed in the New York Times talking about black anti-Semitism, which had started with, it's always, it's been there, but Malcolm X made quite a thing about it. And he called my, that called my attention to it. And he was very supportive in his letter to me saying this, this had to be said, and I'm glad you said it. And so I, that was a good letter, but I got plenty of, I got people who had Xerox pages of Cheikh Anta Jop, uh, the Senegalese writer who was trying to show that, you know, ball off the, the, that language was connected with uh, ancient Egyptian and many other things that really are pretty unprovable. <laughs> and, and that it had been widely read. And there was this whole literature that was out there that most white scholars had been totally unaware of. And indeed, very few of us had noticed that Tony Martin was teaching some of this stuff as if it were true and well-researched. And it was quite, <laughs> quite a revelation and caused quite a controversy, as you have read, I'm sure. And 
I, it was it was an interesting experience in the sense of the Chinese, the alleged Chinese curse. May we live in interesting times. I know my subs. I know that if they haven't read this book by now, now they're going to do it when they see this episode. So my question would be, for those who have not read it yet, what would you say some of the key points of your book are not out of Africa? Well, the main key, key point is that Greek philosophy wasn't stolen from anywhere. Um, actually, you can't steal philosophy from anywhere because if you stole it, the other people would still have it. Because that's the way literature or anything written or any ideas work. So it isn't like, you know, stealing someone's TV set. But uh, it's, I think that, I, I think that's Im- Im- important, but it's also important for people to know that you can't read ancient source materials naively. And when Plato tells a story about how the wisdom of the Egyptians or when someone writes about, uh, I'm sure they were very wise, but he didn't know a heck of a lot about it because he couldn't get to Egypt. It was occupied by the Persians at that time, and the relationships between Greeks and Persians was always complicated, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, uh, Herodotus got, got to, to Egypt uh, in the 5th century, in the sort of last uh, quarter of the 5th century, around then. He was uh, living in in Halicarnassus, which was then part of the Persian Empire. So he, and he was a very rich man. You couldn't travel at all unless you had mega money. And so uh, he was able to get there. And his report is, is, a lot of it's very, very accurate. And if he got stuff wrong, it was just simply because he was told wrong stuff. And, and you know, the, the, the Egyptian priests told him, gave him the names of the gods but they gave them mostly Greek names because they wanted him to understand it. And they were talking Greek to him. He didn't know Egyptian, but uh, I, and he got some measurements wrong and things like that. But I think he was, he was a, he's an extremely important figure and indeed the father of history and of trying to find out history, meaning inquiry, you try and learn. Um, so that's, that's one, uh, that's one aspect of it. Uh, so I think it's, I think the main thing everyone should learn from this controversy is how to read sources carefully and to check your references and to look things up and, and to um, question your assumptions. Always question your assumptions. Could this be right? If it isn't, why isn't it? That, that would be the thing I, I learned most from. And how to, well, not to, you know, not to, not to read anything naively, but also not to take criticism too harshly and try to understand where the criticism is coming from. But it was painful in many ways to, to listen to some of the things people said about me and are still saying about me, it, because that's not, that's not what I was trying to do. And, and the Greeks think I was, I was defending Greece. And I, I was, but far more important than Greece is getting things right, getting at the truth, whatever that is, as close as we can ever get. Uh, Greece is, and Greek civil, ancient Greek civilization had great achievements, and one of the one of them was the invention of of history. Again, you can't take things too much; you have to question everything, whatever it is. I, I was kind of upset when uh, uh, Rebecca Futo Kennedy. Um, spoke about me as some sort of German philologist. I'm certainly not. And I would like to respond to that in some way because it's, and, and I think Brunel was totally wrong about philology too and its aims. And so as many of my f- subscribers are familiar with, I recently had an episode that really kind of touched on what Black Athena was and what did it represent. But my question now is I wanted to get your viewpoint in your opinion, what was Black Athena to you? What did it represent to you? Oh, gosh. Uh, I think Brunel was extremely sincere in what he was trying to do. I think it was partly inspired by the fact that his grandfather, who is a, on his mother's side, who is a distinguished 
Egyptologist. Uh, was like a lot of other Brits uh, who had property in Africa and who was exploiting the natives. And I think that while it may not have been at all the worst exploitation, it may have been one of the better places, but he was, it upset him and understandably so. Actually, I liked Martin very, very much as, as a person because he was, he was very interesting. And uh, uh, it, was, it was always fun to talk to. And in fact, I, I invited him, uh, along with my colleague in Africana Studies, Selwyn Kajo, to come to Wellesley uh, to give a talk and 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 talk to my one of my classes as well he never returned the favor i may say but it 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 was uh you know i felt it would be better to have a discussion than than not to have a discussion about these issues and i wish tony martin had been willing to do that because people learn from that i have what one thing that really propelled me to do this, and maybe this may sound too sentimental, I don't know, is I, I felt that we should discuss these, these issues very much. And so when I heard that Dr. Joseph A. Ben, Yo a. A. ben Yochanan was coming to give the Martin Luther King lecture in uh, 1993, and I thought, well, I need to go to this. And I wasn't well at all at the time. I was having chemotherapy for breast cancer. And I was both, and it was nearing the end of the protocol. And I was really pretty tired. But I dragged myself over there. And I heard him, and it was mostly black students. There were a few white faculty, and that was it. And, and I heard him give this talk, which was just straight out of uh, Stolen Legacy all these stories, and he said Aristotle stole his philosophy from the library at Alexandria, which is chronologically impossible. And, uh, and, this, and then, but what was even more upsetting than that was that he said, don't, uh, Ben Yochanan said, don't listen to what any white faculty tell you. Only listen to Dr. Tony. And I thought, this is not what we're supposed to be doing here. We we're supposed to be questioning everything. I would never say that to any, anybody, you know. I would never say, don't take Tony Martin's class. And, uh, you know, it's just, it, that, that was really shocking. So that's when I got up and asked and said, uh, <laughs> how can you say that Aristotle stole his philosophy from the library to Alexandria when the library of Alexandria wasn't built until after Aristotle's death, and Aristotle never went to Egypt anyway. So that produced kind of an uproar. But that's what college is for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what you want people to do. You want people to question things and not take what anybody says. Well, I ever say to a class, don't listen to anybody else. I mean, it's just nuts. So, uh, and, you know, that's, so it sort of went on from there. So it was certainly a, it, it, I couldn't stop writing about it or talking about it because it was one of those moments where you just have to uh, deal with the controversy and figure that people will learn from it, which I think they did um, over time. And, uh, and I certainly learned from it. And I'm very glad people are discussing things now in politics. They, they have to. I think I felt at the time, because I was sick, that, and I, I think my chances of survival, I knew at the time, were pretty good, but you never know with cancer. And I thought, well, if I have one thing to do with my life, I'm going to write something about this, which was not out of Africa. And, uh, and we were, were, Guy Rogers and I were working on, uh, Black Athena revisited at the same time. I was pretty tired, and I could at least read, even if I couldn't write a lot. And uh, so that, that's how I got involved. And then I spent most of that whole decade working on various aspects of this issue. And, you know, it's not 
it's not settled. Nothing is ever settled in history. It has to be reread and reinterpreted. Uh, people have to look at uh, these issues again, uh, and more information may come to light in some way. It's kind of unlikely, but we may at least understand things better for, for reasons I can't understand at the moment. But certainly, Bernal uh, was was wrong about you know an Egyptian invasion of uh, of Greece. But people are wrong to, on the other hand, to think that Egyptian civilization was white, which is nonsense. And uh, what exactly the Egyptians looked like, it's hard to know because there are no photographs. But uh, it's it's. And art isn't representative in a, in a direct way. But uh, Frank Yerko, who was one of the um, contributors to the book we wrote about Black Athena, you know, a bunch of us wrote and this Black Athena revisited. You can see all the notes I put to myself in it. Uh, uh, Frank Yerko, who was a, an Egyptologist at, at um, uh, the Field Museum of Natural History and Chicago, said he thought that probably skin color got darker as you went south. And just look at geography. And, it, you know, Egyptian is an Afro-Asiatic language. It doesn't have a lot of connection with Indo-European. So in the 19th century, once hieroglyphics was deciphered, uh, all these um, uh, German scholars sat down uh, and examine the loan words from e Egyptian that got into Greek. I don't know that Bernal ever saw this. So this was, this was certainly established and known. But the, language, the two languages don't have much to do with each other other than that. But uh, maybe some Greek words got into Egyptian. And certainly um, uh, Greek writing was sort of picked up in, you know, by Coptic. So they had to add more characters. So that's what that's the historical side of it and not the, the sort of idea that whole texts were taken taken away. I, I doubt that most people read texts. It was just for an elite. And most people couldn't read. So uh, the people who could read didn't read. They listened. They listened to somebody reading it to them for the most part. So... <laughs> There were a lot of problems. My next question really touches on academia during the time of Black Athena. And my question is, when Black Athena came out, how divided was academia on this subject? Were there a lot of supporters for Black Athena in the academic community, or were they staunchly against it? Well, I think some, some were. Uh, some, particularly if they weren't classicists, um, I think English departments may have liked it more. I mean, it was the moment of Edward Said, and uh, and actually he came to talk at Wellesley. He was the reason, uh, one of the reasons that uh, Black Athena got published at all, is he was a reader for it uh, from Rutgers University Press. And the book uh, Black Athena had been turned down by a number of university presses before that, um, but this editor. Uh, had a while had an opportunity to have a wild card book published, and that was Black Athena, and of course it made a great success and you know, sold tremendously well. First volume, anyway. Uh, the, the archaeology volume isn't uh, as interesting, and it it's not tremendously good. I don't think uh, Bernal knew enough about <coughs> archaeology. It's sort of hard to imagine how anybody in Greece would have had enough manpower to build anything close to a pyramid. And the closest thing they got were the the Thalos tombs, big ones in Mycenae. And um, but they 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 couldn't, you know, muster that kind of slave and perhaps not slave entirely labor to 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 do a big pyramid as a tomb. So. Certainly, the influence of Egyptian art on Greek art is easy for anybody to see. I saw it as a kid because my rainy day default was to go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So I, I used to 
so impressed by the Egyptian stuff. So uh, it's, it, it, you know, people in, in I not to get off on that topic, but people, uh, people in academe, many were utterly indifferent to it. Um, others, others were quite excited about it. Uh, and, you know, people like the idea of thinking that they can know more than some of their predecessors were limited. And so this makes them taking a, a terrific advance. And Bernal was for a while a celebrity and everyone likes to know a celebrity. Uh, and so that, uh, that gave him some popularity. I remember in particular, uh, uh, a, a woman who was a dean, an English professor, who was a dean uh, at Trinity College in Hartford, who was very anti the classics department because she'd read Bernal. But uh, it was so unfair because they weren't teaching anything racist, as far as I know. <laughs> and they were, they were uh, just doing their job. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with learning Greek and Latin. Uh, you certainly aren't le- learning horrible racist things because even if you read the, say, you read the Aeneid, uh, you come out a lot more sympathetic to Dido than you do to Aeneas. And, and she was a Phoenician anyway, so this certainly wasn't anti-Semitism uh, on the part of Virgil. So I, I think that uh, it was one of those things that made being uh, a classicist chic in a way that you were in a controversial subject, but it all and made people think about it, but they weren't thinking very deeply. And, and, and English departments have always liked to teach classical stuff because they can go into theory and to uh, modern ideas uh, without worrying too much about what the text actually said. And, and I, I think that they always like the idea that they should be teaching that stuff and the, the boring classicists shouldn't. And so I think that gave it a kind of uh, push at, at the time. And Bernal was lecturing all over. And, you know, also he, he struck an important chord, which was that there is tremendous racism in the society and that all white people to a certain extent are guilty of it. And that that people felt better if they thought, well, here we've been caught out in this way and it isn't really hurting us very much to be caught out. Um, it's, but it was, it was at the same time very unfair because no group of white people is in academics or that necess- necessarily by discipline or more racist than any other. Everybody was to some degree because they were white. And they were in this country, and, and it's just part of what this country has been, part of the terrible history of this country. So I, I think that it did make, you know, it was a, there are, have been cheap books, I mean, like Edward Said's book, and uh, who knows what's being read now. I just haven't been reading it. <laughs> and um, it, it's... I, I think I think it's always good to question stuff. It, everyone learns from it. And if it could be done with less rancor and less nastiness, it would be nice. What you touched on without the nastiness and stuff like that, that's so vital to discussing history today. And I wish more people could have that relationship with each other to hear each other out, you know, sit down, actually figure out, you know, am I wrong about this? Is he right about this? You know, is she right about this? And am I wrong about this? You know, and, and you change your views over time to an extent. And honestly, I have such a more open look on history now than I did, you know, let's say 10 years ago. Right. And that's just due to my own experience. And I wish more people were able to have a, a polite dialogue about studies in ancient history and a, uh, I think you'd get more, I think we could come a long way if we could take out the anger and the, and, you know, in many cases, racism from accounts of, you know, people from myself to, you know, others, you know, who may have a prejudiced, maybe a Eurocentric bias. You know, I think if we can learn to get around 
those prejudices. One, we'll see history differently. We can learn so much more. And more importantly, we can have more of an impact on other people and how we talk about history, just like they can have more of an impact on us, if that makes sense. But yeah, that's, I could ramble about that all day. <laughs> no, but it's true. If we can, and I've had some really good, good conversations with people. One of them was a philosopher who's teaching at Haverford College, uh, Lucius Outlaw, whom I'd met years before. And he said, well, you know, just don't get so upset about it. Just be calmer. And he said, I know you're right, uh, but just, uh, you know, just soft pedal it a bit. And uh, I thought that was really great advice because he, you know, he managed in uh, where he's the only black guy in philosophy and whole, you know, in, at, at Haverford and places like that. It must have been um, tough. And just, he just handled it really well. He, at the time, he was teaching, he was visiting at BC, um, and uh, that was, so got to see a bit of him because he was a friend of, friend of mine in Africana studies, so <laughs> just, just good to know. I'm really glad that we had that talk, because we, we were both lecturing at the same, we were both lecturing down at the University of Kentucky at the same time, so... Now we approach Black Athena itself. And in your opinion, would you hit us with some facts that you believe that, you know, how was Black Athena wrong? You know, what did you debunk? Hit us with that. The, the book that that comes up in is Black Athena Revisited. And in it, my, my contribution just mainly reviews it in the context of Afrocentrism. And so the, the basic premise that, Greek philosophy was heavily influenced by, or any Greek thing was by, by Egyptian literature it was questioned, say. Um, I have some serious questions about that. Now I question the etymologies. Most of it was about stolen legacy and its origin, uh, the origin of the idea that Greek philosophy was stolen from Africa or heavily influenced by or taken from Africa comes from a French novel that was written uh, in the 18th century um, by a French priest who just told this fictional story about how there was a great university run by Egyptians in Egypt where priests were trained. It was very similar to the Sorbonne in many ways. And it was, you know, it was a, a sort of novel of Buildings from on a novel of growth of this priest who later decides to become a celibate priest, you know, and he was very high born, and it's called Sethos, uh, and using Greek version of the name uh, Setis, S E T Y S, which is the Egyptian, but he didn't go into that. He didn't know Egyptian. Jean Paulion was down the road a century, so he he. And so he, the only thing he could do was to imagine uh, uh, e Egypt on a European model because nobody knew what the Egyptian model was, if there ever was such a thing. So that book was wildly popular in the first part of the 18th century. And it's, it, it, it's, it was inspirational to Freemasonry and it was preserved in Freemasonry. And in this country... Uh, it got over to this country, Freemasonry, with, with the founding fathers, uh, George Washington, Ben Franklin. Um, but there was also blacks got into it. Uh, the first black people, some of whom were free in this country. Uh, and they, they took it up from there. And that's how uh, George G.M. James, who wrote Stolen Legacy, was a Mason and a black Mason. They were segregated. Of course, particularly in the South, particularly in Arkansas, where where he was teaching at this college, and and, and that's where the man who called himself Yosef A. A. Ben Yochanan uh, learned it, and he was the one who edited the papers of uh, George G. M. James, who was a West Indian who died very mysteriously. Just he was probably just terribly sick. I mean, goodness knows what his life was. 
was like in, in Arkansas. And he, he died, and uh, his papers and ideas were published by Ben Yochanan, and that book has sold a lot of copies. But it is based essentially on a European myth. It isn't really even African, which is what's so upsetting about it. So I think that's the, my major contribution was to figure that out. And I did it in part by chance. It's so often one discovers things. I, in the summer of 93, I happened to have gone over to England with, with my husband, who uh, was originally based in Oxford. And, uh, and we had lunch with um, some friends, and they'd invited a very distinguished musicologist. And we were talking about what we were doing, and I was talking about this this topic I was working on. I didn't really understand how what Freemasonry had to do with it. And he said, well, you must read this book, this musicologist said, by uh, the French priest Jean Terrasson. And that's the myth behind Mozart's The Magic Flute. And suddenly there it was. The next day I went to the Bodleian and sat down and, and uh, read this thing. Uh, Fortunately, there was an English translation, so I could read it faster than in French. So it 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 was wildly popular. It was translated in German as well. This book, but I've totally forgotten about it. Now you can get it on the internet. Many people that I have interacted with will usually bring up Herodotus. Herodotus, the father of history. Some people call him the father of lies. I don't agree with that. I believe he's the father of history that may have occasionally been lied to, or that's what I like to say, or, you know, may have occasionally been misled. They use Herodotus as a way of showing an African influence on Greece. And I was hoping you would have, ex you would expand on this and kind of set the record straight. Herodotus is the father of history in a way. Uh, he he really, he's a great writer and someone whose contribution is really immense. And I have the greatest respect for him. I don't go along with the liar school of Herodotus, which says he's making up stories. I think he was told things that may have been slightly wrong or wrong. And he, this is what he learned. And he said it, it, the word history means inquiry. He was asking people stuff. And, and as I, I said, he, he, uh, he was able to get to Egypt, which was then under the control of Persia, because he lived in the part of Asia Minor, or what's now Turkey, Halicarnassus, which is now Bodrum, which isn't that far away, relatively speaking. Uh, and it's, uh, he was able to do it. He was probably a very wealthy man. Who else could travel in those days? And so he, and a lot has been shown that he really names the places he got straight. So I think he was, was told by the priests that the names of the gods were the same because they were using Greek names for the gods so that he would relate to them and understand them because Greeks had been in Africa, in Egypt anyway, in that part of Africa, for some time, there was a trading station at Nocritus, and they traded with uh, the Egyptians and knew about them and learned from them as, as well. Uh, Egypt was a very rich place, and they had wheat and things that were impossible to grow or difficult to grow in most places in Greece. There are places where you can, but it was uh, it's a mountainous, difficult, rocky in many ways country side and not well watered enough for extensive farming Greece is so this is the, the Greeks admired the Egyptian I think uh, that's all all correct so if he makes the occasional mistake so what I, I think that is very important to read I, I, people in academe you know uh, uh, often don't respect each other's departments whatever they are sufficiently uh, and I think that's, that's too bad because th they should. And it, it, sometimes it may come from the subjects they didn't like very much at school because they were badly taught. But there are always these moves to, well, let's get rid of the science requirement. 
Well, I, I think that's a big mistake too. I think it's, I think all that kind of uh, disrespect for other disciplines is, is kind of crazy, but. The main focus of this, uh, this presentation is really trying to sort out what Black Athena got wrong. And you've touched on that quite a bit. My question is, by itself, when it comes to archaeology and primary sources, in what ways do you think Black Athena as a hypothesis really messes up? I think archaeology is one of the things that people are most fascinated by and most often get wrong. Because the real practice of archaeology is very painstaking and requires a tremendous amount of technical skill. It isn't like you can just go someplace and start digging and then you discover a great thing. This is not how it's done anymore. That certainly may have been the way they did in the 18th century, but, and even in the 19th, the Schliemann made a number of mistakes at, at Mycenae, just digging through very relevant things. You have to do a search of what's in the site and what, what determine, you know, everything, uh, both human remains and vegetable remains. And you can learn a lot from that. So it's, it's not the, the moment when you really find the great treasure is very, very rare. And when you do, it's, it's fantastic. But uh, even then, you've got to be extremely careful to get everything right. That certainly wasn't what was done originally. So archaeology is, is hard to get straight unless you're an archaeologist and you have to have tremendous respect for that. And armchair archaeology is, is very often wrong. And I think that's what Bernal was, essentially, in armchair archaeology. He was told, one of the things he came up with was the idea that the tomb of Menelaus, so-called, which is a bunch of buildings up on top of a very high hill, was a pyramid. And well, you don't build pyramids on top of mountains. It's just not a really convenient place to do it. You've got to get the, uh, the stones up without, without modern uh, equipment. Uh, you've got to use uh, mules or horses or something at, uh, that and slave labor or just plain labor to do anything. And there, there are, there, I, I've seen some uh, Greek temples that were built quite high up, but it, it must, they weren't completed necessarily. And you know, how they got the stones up even into Mycenae to build what they built is a tremendous labor. And, or the Acropolis, it, it's just, it's staggering. I, I can't think of any. And, and in Egypt, it just blows them on completely uh, what, what they were able to do. Um, but they had manpower and, and some really good engineering. But yeah, I think archaeology is very hard to get right and very technical. I, I try to learn as much about it as I can by traveling frequently to Greece and Asia Minor, other places I've been as much as I can learn and, uh, and listen to archaeologists, but I don't write about it much because I don't know enough. When it comes to primary sources and, uh, you know, especially in the ancient world, what are uh, samples that uh, Dr. Burnell got wrong in Black Athena? Well, the fact that he didn't know Greek very well was a disadvantage and that he constructed all these etymologies. He relies much too much on these really very amateurish etymologies. Because it isn't as if the etymologies of words ha have been con very much discussed and explored and known. Of course, he knows that he knew that, that Greek is an Indo European language. And yes, he's right that there are a great many words that the origin of which is not known. That doesn't mean they're Egyptian. Uh, it can mean, it does, I, we don't know what it means if we don't know it. And it, it, Egyptian is a language that, since Jean-Paulion's discovery, has been known. And if there had been a lot of Egyptian words in ancient Greek, it, they would have uh, uh, discovered it in the 19th century. Because they were well on to techniques that are used in many respects today. So I, I don't think that 
That was one thing that certainly Burnell got wrong. Uh, I think he was wrong also in hypothesizing that there was an invasion of Greece from Egypt because there are some Egyptian artifacts and Egyptian influence, certainly, which no one has ever denied in Greek art. Um, but that, you know, people can bring stuff back from Egypt uh, and dedicate it to a god, say, a Eleusis to Demeter, or cult of Demeter, and things like that. That's, that's just normal. So you will find scarabs and stuff like that in Greece, uh, in, in ancient Greece, and come up in an archaeological dig. But that just, we knew that anyway. And I, so I think he, he was a bit not naive about that. But the main thing I think he got wrong were all those etymologies. It's, it's just, yeah, it's, it was very persuasive to people who, he's a very good, he was a very good arguer. If I ever have time, I might sit down and reread Black Athena just for the rhetorical skill with which he gets you involved in his world and his way of thinking and, and propels you along. First, the sort of destruction of the uh, Eurocentric, uh, anti-Semitic and anti and racist, anti-black classicist, and then just so that you're very sympathetic to him. And then you... Uh, go on and he leads you into this discussion and puts in, well, look, the, the, the suppliants, the Hicketides, comes from the Hyksos. Well, no, it doesn't actually. It's not a good etymology at all. Everything is wrong about it, but it's, you know, you just are, are kind of carried away by it. And I, I think, uh, and he's very, very, overly critical and it puts attributes to everybody who criticize them the worst possible motives. Uh, whereas often the motives are ignorance <laughs> or just getting things wrong or just not thinking about it. And where he got this animus, I don't know. Was it at school? He may not have liked the classics uh, teachers. I don't know. You know, in England, uh, study of the classics got such a priority back in the day. I don't think it does anymore. I don't know. In the trilogy, Black Athena, uh, in your opinion, does it get anything at all right, even if it's more of an academic critique? For example, Dr. Rebecca Fudo Kennedy briefly discussed how it highlighted certain racisms or prejudices within academia. Would you agree with this at all? And what are your thoughts uh, when she mentioned you as well? I, I agree with her that the classicists have been rather blinkered in their approach to the ancient past and not paid enough attention to Egypt. And, and many in the 19th century thought of Egypt as being somehow separate from the rest of Africa, which I think is not a very plausible suggestion. And, and thinking of them as, you know, white somehow. I mean, this is just that. But it, I, I, I think that Bernal's critique, however, of German classical philology was very overstated. And work has been done that uh, I don't know whether Dr. Kennedy's aware of it or not by European scholars showing that he misrepresented some of the German scholars, uh, quite a bit. Not all. I mean, there, there's always racism around, and I certainly would go for that. But she spoke of me rather dismissively as a uh, philologist, as if I hadn't ever studied history, as if I hadn't ever thought about race issues, as if, you know, anything. This is just, I think, a little unfair. But... <laughs> I can understand where she's coming from. And that was not, I, I, I can't tell you how often I examine myself and ask myself, is this a racist thing to say? What, what in my background is making me think this? You, know, you have to really think all the time. So I don't think philology is necessarily dulls the mind, which is one of the things that Bernal claims in, in, his, in his beginning of his book is that you can't think if you just memorize declensions. Well, certainly I didn't do a lot of thinking while I was memorizing declensions. And, and uh, 
and uh, conjugations, which is something I did in school um, when my memory was younger and better. But I think it also, the discipline of learning is very helpful, that, and that's why I think people did it. And you can also learn a lot from it if you think about it, because that is the basic of studying etymologies of words. And it's very useful studying it, again, looking back at it and saying, well, why do they think this way about human experience? Why have we divided everything into first, second, and third persons then? Why do we have the tenses we have? Because other languages don't do things that way at all. Uh, my husband spoke often about learning Japanese during the Second World War because they recruited a lot of young, very young guys. He was 18 when he enlisted in the British Army and he learned uh, Japanese. And he said, you would have thought that, because he knew Indo-European languages, that this is the way people thought, but not a bit of it. It's totally different. Uh, and so I think learning languages and learning a language outside, I wish I had ever done that outside of Indo-European, would have been a really exciting thing because you can you, you query the world rather differently. Uh, and so in a way, uh, even Greek and Latin, which are certainly not as far apart from English as Japanese uh, or Chinese, uh, even that slight step, relatively speaking, makes you think differently and makes you think about what words mean and makes you expand your vocabulary. So I don't think it's a restriction on the mind at all. Of course, you have to go beyond it and learn other things. But philology, in the, if Germans in the 19th century were in some ways racist, and of course, as they were in the 20th century, anti-Semitic, that is from the society, not from the discipline of classics. For novices like myself and others who are far better educated, in your opinion, how can we really make history better, not only as we teach it, but how can we study it better? How can we better inform others about it? And really, would you guide us through things to keep in mind when we study history and when we tell people about it? Well, we're all, you know, blinkered. Any human being can only do so much, even really great, smart ones. And uh, I think we're, we're all limited by our background, what we see and what we don't see and what we're taught to see. So that's why history always has to be rewritten. And all those questions have to be raised. And uh, I think the only thing you can say is you do the best you can and realize that you're never going to get it right because you're human. And there are things you're not going to know. And there are things you can't know because the information isn't available. But if you really work hard, you, you do a little better. Uh, but I think that's, you know, all these, all these ideas will have to be discussed and rediscussed about the ancient world. And every time I read, reread an ancient text, I think, well, why didn't I think of that before? Uh, and I'm just one person, so, you know, that somebody else is going to have, have some great insight or a new thing. But it's, yeah, I think that's why we always have to keep doing it. You know, maybe we'll get a little better as time goes on. Um, and ancient, ancient history is always relevant. Just and Probably all history is always relevant. I just don't know it. But uh, I certainly think reading uh, Thucydides in the light of what's happening in the United States um, and today is, is really <laughs> very enlightening. And the human tendency, I think one of the great things about Thucydides, for, for example, is that he talks about to anthropinon, which is the, the human something, the human thing, not, but the, the thing isn't the right word, but what it is to be human. And that means that you're very prone to error and prone to believing your own propaganda. And eventually, that may lead you into trouble. And so if we learn anything from history, it's to ask ourselves a question or two. Ask yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I thinking? 
That's the only, that's one of the great gifts of history. Uh, what is this guy doing wrong? Uh, what am I doing wrong? And uh, that, that's how we can make baby steps forward, which it seems to be all the human race is capable of. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today on the study of antiquity in the Middle Ages with Dr. Lefkowitz. We explored a variety of topics from racism in the U.S. to Black Athena, things that got wrong, things that it made points on that she also discusses, and really just all the awesome things that Dr. Lefkowitz covered with us today. Dr. Lefkowitz, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me.